Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is September 8th, 2021, and I'm so honored to be here with Esperanza Martel, a revolutionary, educator, mother, artist, healer, and so, so much more. And she's done a lot of her work in organizing in the Bronx, um, even though she's only lived here uh, off and on a little bit um, in the Bronx. And much of her life story is already recorded in an oral history at Centro um, for the Puerto Rican Oral History Project. But for this particular oral history, we'll be focusing more on her time in the Bronx, as well as any other aspects of uh, Esperanza's life that she wants to share. Uh, so I guess to start off, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your first encounter or experiences in the Bronx? Well, thank you for having me um, remember my Bronx history. Uh, so my, I be, began doing activism in the Bronx. Um, with, I guess the, the, because I'm trying to really place myself, right? So in the late, I would say like in the late 60s. Sure. When folks were fighting for community control, bilingual education, Absolutely. and child care, basically. Sure. So, Folks like Evelina Antonetti is one was the leading person in a lot of those struggles. She did a lot of coalition work sure. and was part of Brown versus Brown. Yeah. In, yeah. in the Board of Education. Right? So you know, I was young. I was in my early twenties yeah. or late teens. And I would come and support actions. Sure. I supported actions in the Lower East Side also, in the Barrio. Yeah. And of course, in my community in mid Manhattan. Sure. Which was a Puerto Rican and black community until we were displaced, which is still pockets. Yeah. In the, in the 80s and the 90s. Sure. But we mostly had been displaced in that area. So what comes to mind is coming to the Bronx, actually around here, around 138th Street. Yeah. And, and going to demonstrate a demonstration for the independence of Puerto Rico. Sure. And and um, also doing support organizing yeah. with the community based organization. If when when the young lords when the young lords were up here and this again is in the early in the early seventies. Sure. I did I did some support work with a with the detox clinic. Yeah. After the takeover, uh, actually, my my mother and my aunt came to me with me, um, and work with Matulu Shakur sure, sure. from the Black Liberation Army yeah, and, Walter. And, and Walter Bach yeah. from the Lord, Young Lord doing, because I already, I had already been a, a drug counselor. Okay, yeah, I yeah. started doing anti-drug work and counseling very young because sure. my front, my, my, my brother had been a drug addict, and um, after he overdosed at 17, mm -hmm. I actively like I gotta learn about this and how yeah. do we how do we protect our our community? So 
a I did that in the early 70s. Yeah. I also a I was I joined a community-based organization. 1970 was a really powerful year for me. Sure. And and in and the movement. Um I had been a night student at City College mm. in 68 and 69 when the takeover had happened. Yeah. So I met I met some of the people that eventually formed the Young Lords. Sure. Um and you, you in the moment you develop friendships. Yeah. I um I went to Cuba in in 19 August 1970. The young lords had that large demonstration for independence of Puerto Rico. A uh, during that time, a lot of takeovers. Yeah. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the takeover of the church. Yeah. Um. Actually, when I I left for Cuba the end of August and came back at the end of October. And the first thing I did was to go to the church. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's the, the first thing I did, and we were really pumped. However, I didn't join the Young Lord because in 1970. I was 24, sure. and I was already formed politically, yeah. I guess, yeah. or, or stronger than other people. And the average age of the young girls was 16 and 17. Yeah, much, much younger. And I already had this p position around drugs, yeah, yeah. right? And I went to the office on 111th Street, and poof, I got this big puff. <laughs> of uh, smoke and I said no I can't join this group so I joined a community group that was forming sure. in the west, in the west side yeah. and I'm an artist um, and I was actually working I had a job job as an artist being a layout artist okay yeah yeah so I was asked if I would take assist be assist with the news community newspaper yeah. and I said sure and I came here right here to 140 right I mean you didn't mention that we were Brook Park uh, I should have done that and in the beginning you should have said that uh, Brook Park between a uh, Brook and Willis yes, yes. so the young law's office was on Willis I think it's 140th here yeah. on Willis. And so I spend actually two weeks almost every day at the office wow. with Richie Paris, sure. who was my age. You know, the thing is, in that time, we were all teaching each other. Yeah. You know, and, Rich, and Richie was already a high school teacher and an educator. Yeah. And he was the one that did the Young Laws paper, Palante. Yeah. So I learned, it felt longer, I mean, but I learned how to lay out a newspaper, what's important. I mean, I already had skills, but I, from a political perspective, sure. I was able to learn many things. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I created uh, with uh, Federico Lora, who was the. I became part of the steering committee. Okay. I was part of the first steering committee of the Comité. Sure, sure. So I see myself as one of the founders. Yeah. Actually, the only woman founder, but it was started by Federico Lora sure. and some other other men who. And we were about the same age, so we were older, working yeah. workers, working class, you know, in factories and etc. And and they were in a baseball team, and out of this base baseball team grew, because 
it was this time of the squatter movement. Yeah. So they took over. They took over a bit, uh, an office right in the corner of a 88th Street and Columbus Avenue. Okay, okay, yeah. So, a, one of the things besides, you know, besides doing the housing, organizing, I was the person that a coordinating organizing. Okay, I was the lead wow. organizer. Yeah. I had skills. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. For sure. And um and knew already knew a lot of people in the city. Sure. Uh, so I we did the newspaper, we laid it out, we took it to the printer. Yeah. I mean, um, people don't understand because everything is digitized now yeah. that we had to press letters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen some old press proofs letters. and it's crazy to even yes. and, hours, um, hours And we had a team. We worked in a team. You know, we had tr our translators because it was in Spanish and English. Yeah. We had artists. We had you know, and I was the person who led in the layout. I wow, did yeah. the layout. Um, and this, uh, I wish I had a, one of the papers with me. Yeah. Because whenever, at the end, whenever there was an empty, little empty space, I would do a little wiggle. I was going to ask you if you ever did any art for the paper. It, yeah. It very, you know, it was <laughs> yeah, just whatever. fill in. Yeah. Feeling, but not actual art. I, I'm very, I had spirals, you know, things that could fill up a little space. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so the other thing that we did was that we sold the newspaper. Sure. Right? So my, I, my beat, I had two beats, right? One was a the Lorry side mm. and Williamsburg. Sure. And you know, I, we always had partners. Actually, my partner was um, Max Colon, who is a wonderful Puerto Rican photographer. Mm. You know, he's a master photographer. Um, and he used to take pictures for the for the newspaper. But the other beat. My, our other beat was the Bronx. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bronx. Um, so, and you know, when, and when you do this kind of work, you go to places where people don't go. Because sure. the idea is that we wanted the community to have this information in their head. Yeah. And you, and, and this story, you could, you know, double check with us. Jose Rivera, the assemblyman. Sure, sure. <laughs> so one of the places that we distribute the paper and sold it. I mean, you know, the paper, I don't know, at one time was 15 cents, another yeah. time it's 25, we're talking about. And then we would actually sit with people and read the paper to them. Sure. Um, Jose Rivera had one of those little food trucks way way back then yeah <laughs> and we would go and say he was selling Gucci people and we would go to his his um his place his little stand and we would sell newspapers there and and to Jose Rivera and engage the community yeah in in dialogue Jose Rivera said says, you know, public he, he said, has said that the reason he went into politics was because of me. Wow. It's my fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have <laughs> a Jose <laughs> Rivera. I always laugh. I always laugh, you know, because I'm not big on electoral politics. Sure, sure. But I'm big on everybody organizing and finding out uh, how to push yeah. the struggle. Yeah. Right? So that was another time 
in the Bronx eh, doing, you know, bringing, bringing this newspaper. Sure. Um, we also, the, the, the young lords were in existence for four years, yeah. right? The El Comité was in existence for 10 years. Yeah. But I was in El Comité only in their two, the two first four, or two and a half formative years. Okay, I see, I see. Okay? Yeah. Um, and did a lot of coalition work. Sure. A lot of building. You know, we used to put posters, because before what we did was a, what is it, with, 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 uh, just paste up oh, a poster sure, yeah. with actual with flour actually. Yeah, flour and water, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, we create our own way of doing so. A one of the things that uh, we worked on was a conference to free the Puerto Rican political prisoners. Sure. A large conference. The con the the conference was in St. Angel's Church in, in, in East Harlem. Sure. The, the priest, I don't remember his name right now, was very pro-independence of Puerto Rico. Yeah. He was a liberation theologist. Sure. And a very supportive. So what we... When I said we, I'm talking about a comité. Sure. A, our goal was to create a united front yeah. of all Puerto Rican groups and with any allies to free the five nationalists. Sure. The five nationalists. A, so part of the work, right, the, even though the, the conference, because it was being organized citywide. Yeah. So part of the work for that was doing the pay stops and, and the organizing. Sure. And the young lords were part of that when we formed the, the, now I don't remember the name. A, it'll come to me. Sure. I'll share it. A, the, which is basically of the United Front for the Freedom of Puerto Rican Political Prisoners. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Big title there. And the young lord sat on that besides sure. a MPI, okay, yeah. which then became the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. And we, we had close to a thousand people at that conference. Wow. You know, it, it was a real, to develop a real, real campaign yeah. for their freedom. Then nine years later, they were free. Yeah. But it, you know, even though the young lords weren't around, members of the young lords like Richie Perez sure. and Panama Alba Absolutely, and yeah. um, Mickey Melendez, they crea created the Free Puerto Rico Now Committee, sure, which was here in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Panama told me a little bit yes. about it. Yes. Yeah. So they they were they were working on this. Yeah. And other groups were also working on the release of the Nationalists. Yeah. But a lot of the work, I would say, came out of the Bronx. Sure. You know, and we're talking about folks from the Bronx, from the west side, Manhattan, from Harlem, from East Harlem, from the Lower East Side, from Sunset Park, yeah. from Williamsburg, wherever there was a Puerto Rican community, sure. there were committees to free the national. Yeah, yeah. So that work was very important. Absolutely. Very important. A, let me see. Anything else in the 70s I remember? No. Okay. 
the 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 um Richie Paris and Mickey Melendez and Panama and some other people created the National Committee for Puerto Rican Rights. Sure. And the founding meeting for that was at Osos. Ah, okay, okay, College. sure, sure, sure. And I, I remember, you know, it was, I remember ni <laughs> ni 1981. Yeah. Because I gave birth in January. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then this conference was in March, and I was asked to, sh to chair. Sure. Uh, to chair the women's committee. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I remember it well because after that conference, my son never breast breastfed it anymore. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is <clears throat> my point of reference. Yeah. A, but that was very important Absolutely. because what they, we were able to pulled together was what, what was left of the Puerto Rican movement sure. after the uh, attack by Control Pro. Absolutely, yeah. And a, which destroyed many of the organizations, Definitely. many of the organizations, you know, um, PSP, El Comité, course the young laws much sure. earlier sure. so I think it was 74 yeah. you know PSP and the comité was in the early 80s I see, I see. so part of it was like to regroup yeah yeah and to re regroup with members from different organizations sure right and I'm just giving you the, the, the name the organization that people know. Yeah. There was another organization called Resistencia Puerto Rican. Okay. Yeah. You know, and there was another organization in the Manhattan Valley area around 106th Street. Okay. And I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. But they did excellent work. Yeah. Um. And. The struggle for most of us, I'm sure you already heard how. Definitely. So I was there supporting that struggle. Sure, sure, yeah. It took me 11 years to get out of City College. Yeah. I was a student for a long time. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. most of the struggles uptown, not, you know, I didn't go to Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, but most of the struggles I was part of, whether in the Bronx or whether in Manhattan. Sure, sure. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start with um, the struggle at Ostos and then uh, go back earlier for a little bit. Um, but with the struggle at, at Ostos, uh, um, what are some of the ways that you were involved in that struggle? Strike or student strike support or things like that? or what? Because I know part of, I don't remember which parts of the school were taken over, but I know students occupied parts of the school for a pretty long time. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, but well, I was um, I guess student sure. support. Um, people at Ramon Jimenez, a friend. Yeah. So I have all these you know, comrades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, and whatever was needed, I was available to do work. Yeah, yeah. I have been always the person who does outreach, does media outreach work okay, for the sure. press. Um, not security but from the outside yeah I don't yeah. know if that makes sense to you yeah yeah that does um and emotional support sure you know sure. people knew that they could call me at any time they could get a meal from me 
you know, that I would troubleshoot for them. Yeah. So that kind. Sure, sure, sure. I support. Sure. And I, I'm sure that that kind of support was really crucial uh, because for, you know, the students who are directly involved in uh, in the actions uh, that some of them were arrested and, and some of them weren't, but, you know, there had to be hundreds of people supporting each one of those each one of those people or wouldn't have been successful. I mean, the city of New York, as I understand it, and the state of New York would have closed down Hostos and Bronx Community College, combined them into one. That was their plan, and to completely slash the budget, completely slash open admissions. It was but, a real powerful community effort. Yeah. yeah. On every level, across class lines. Yeah. You know, because that's the only way Puerto Ricans have been able to do anything. Definitely. You know, even the freedom of the political prisoners yeah. was way to cross caste line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, in retrospect, you know, it's amazing. Every struggle that we had was just amazing. Yeah. And that we, and that we were able, with our, with our differences, Sure. you know, we were able to come together to deal with this one issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so many, so many vic victorious struggles. I mean, definitely, definitely, you know, plenty of uh, setbacks along the way too, but so many victorious struggles. And I don't think uh, there's many other people in, in New York that uh, could claim as as many victorious struggles as the Puerto Rican people in New York. That's really amazing. Even though some of them were just partial victories. Sure, sure. You know, um, I always say, you know, we took over high rises on the west side yeah. of Manhattan, and we were able to get thirty percent of those high rises to go to lo low income people. Sure. And at that moment, it was a victory. Yeah. But in retrospect, it was a partial victory. Yeah. Because we didn't qualify what low income meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, and now, you know, 50000 a year is low income. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I know, I know. You know. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So that, you know, you learn lessons. You learn lessons. Yeah. A, but I think, for me, all the struggle is about waging them across class lines, getting allies. Sure. And, um, yeah. So, you know, my work... So I was a youth worker for a long time, job, job. I was mostly a youth worker on the west side of Manhattan sure. and the Lower East Side. And dealing with the issues of youth. Yeah. You know, I did, I did a Draft counseling. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Because I was, yeah. was anti-the war. Yeah. The Vietnam War. So, finding alternatives for the young people. And we got a lot of people who go to the reserves, <laughs> you know. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so, I did, I did that kind of work, work, work. And... But my political work, and then later I did, you know, I was a researcher for the Food and Hunger Hotline. Yeah. And, you know, I, that was early 80s, and I discovered a, a Koch said that there was no hunger in the city, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I went out and I never got a copy of that report and found a hundred soup kitchens. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, yeah, yeah. All over the city, yeah. and then the Hong Kong Hotline did a report. Yeah. 
So I did that kind of work. Sure. Um, but my, and that was work, right? Yeah. But my real work was for the independence of Puerto Rico. Yeah. And to free Puerto Rican political prisoners. Sure, sure. So that's what I dedicated myself for forever. And also, stopping violence against women of color. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been after a comité. I never was like in an organization, sure. but I did. I was in or issue organization like to free the political prisoners, yeah. whatever. One of the things that we had to do is find go we used to find churches that would support us sure sure especially in the work around political prisoners because of the attacks of the state yeah yeah and there were churches here in the Bronx yeah that did that that um support work San Anne's church San Anne's church right here yeah on a hundred and but it's 140th, 139, 140. It was one of the, the churches sure. and the peace and the priest, Roberto Morales, mm. a liberation theology church. And for a long time, I did work, you know, as an open Marxist. Yeah. And people knew I didn't believe in God. Yeah. A, I did work with their justice ministry. Sure, sure. <laughs> they had a, uh, a prisoner justice ministry. Wow. So I did work with them. So that when in 1985, yeah. August of 1985, Los Macheteros were arrested. Mm. A, an underground Puerto Rican organization who were charged with um, a robbery of Wolf Vago. Okay, sure, They're charged sure. with, with it, it, it's like the, the, the robbery, the biggest robbery in history. Yeah, right? yeah. A, a lot of the work we did out of San Anne Church. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, San Anne and uh, another church in the Lower East Side. I don't remember the name of the church, but most of the work came out of San Anne. Wow. A, the other thing up in San Anne, in San Anne was a, the People's Health Clinic. Oh, sure, sure. Created by Dr. Urayuana Trinidad, who had been an acupuncturist trained by Walter and Matulu. Sure. Um, early, you know, she was one of a, a, the Black Banner. I don't remember exactly the name of the institute, mm. but they opened an institute and were training acupuncturists yeah. who got their license, I think, from in Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we had this people's clinic. I did fasting, massage, and the the emotional component, yeah. the psychosocial component of the clinic. Yeah. A it was a collective sure. of women. Okay, yeah, of yeah. Women. Yeah. A one of the things that I was part of was a 
uh, I was in an initi initiative for Dr. Trinidad was Vida Positiva, mm. a positive life. Yeah. This was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. Wow. And one of the things that we knew, the collective knew, yeah. is that people, white folks were surviving from it, yeah. and it's because they were doing alternative medicine. Yeah. So we created a pilot program. I mean, most of the money came out of our pocket. Yeah. And worked with a group of um, people who are positive with a positive yeah. and then offered them everything that the white folks were being offered for free yeah 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 right wow and to this i don't know everybody but i know that maybe two of them are still alive today yeah. so it was a, wow. a wonderful wonderful project the other project that we began were under this was my project <laughs> yeah with the women women healing circle sure sure i had started them on the in harlem okay yeah in 1980 in 1987 and then a we i moved them you know did I do both of them? I was doing it in a place called Die Associates, right mm. on 125th and Malcolm X. Okay. Not Mal Malcolm X, yeah. And, you know, and this is all work for free. Yeah. This is not yeah. paid work. And the women's circles, it was to stop violence in women's lives. And we taking responsibility to heal ourselves. Yeah. Because we had the same ills sure. as the community at large. Absolutely. You know, we were drinking, we were drugging, we were sexing, we were being abusive to each other. So this was a way of beginning a healing process to then, as we heal ourselves, we can heal our family and heal our community. Yeah. So we, I, we did this work out of, out of um, St. Anne's Church also. We, I was doing that work, as I said, with people who were positive, HIV positive. Then we did fasting and massage and, yeah. you know, they would get acupuncture, Reiki. Yeah. I mean, this is 85. This is like, you know. Absolutely. I'm sure there weren't very many other places that people could no. go for. It, you know, that. so so in and it was basically when I started when I started it was for organizers. Yeah. Right. It was healing for organizers because you could heal an organizer, a woman, and then you could begin to heal a community. Sure. And the organizers who would come to the healing circles were, of course, my friends yeah. who were ex-young lords for Black Panthers, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. or other community organizers. So we began to ha have retreats, and I began to train women in the model sure. that I was proposing. And we started, it's a long name, the, the first world women self-healing circle. Sure, yeah, right? yeah. And we had retreats, we had seasonal retreats. Um, and we, I was basically doing it alone, like from 87, and then it built, so by 1990 we had a collective and it went into 19, into the, the spring of 94. Yeah. So, out of that, out, out of that work, and, and the other thing to say that the women who 
came to the retreats from, from all over the city. Yeah. All over, I, actually, one woman once came from England. Wow. You know, <laughs> you know, and they were, everyone was a black or brown. Sure, sure. You know, because it, it was for women of color. So, after it ended, this a, a young women led basically by Aide Morales. Mm. Um, the other one was a Emily Lopez, sure. and then the other one, the last one was Malta Morales, not related. No but, relation, yeah. Yeah. And Anne began the process of creating Casa Tabek a change. Sure. Um, and we we spend a lot of, I mean, we continue, well, I continue with them to do the monthly healing circles that I have been doing. Sure. And also some retreats, and we got together a board, and Walter was on the board. Okay, Walter was on the board. Okay, Walter yeah, yeah. and a sister called Koshua Tate. Besides, you know, me, I was on the, I was their first board member. Yeah. Um, a Dito. Yeah. He was, he was, uh, Dito was from the Bronx, Walter was from the Bronx. Um, uncle, Matulu's uncle. I'll remember his name. But anyway, and, um, Amando, a guy from Musica Against Drugs from, from the, from Brooklyn. Okay. You sure, know, so sure, it was yeah. created by political activists who wanted more yeah. for the, the women, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Under the leadership of these and when I said young, they were in their 20s. Yeah. You know, they were like in their 20s. Amazing. I mean, they're still amazing today. Yeah. But amazing young women. And eventually, and we were looking, and we kept looking for spaces, and we would do in different community healing circles. Sure. And. I don't know exactly how the sister got found us. Yeah. Right. I can't tell you. A, her name Sandra Hernandez. Mm. An organizer on this block. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hundred and fortieth Street. And um. And I think she came to one of our retreats with another organizer from this block, two or other organizers, black women from this block. And they said, we want this for our community. Yeah. We, cause you know, the six buildings right here, right there, they had been taken on management. You know, there's some management and they're supposed to have given service. Sure to the community. So they so they gave us a space, wow. free rent, yeah. Yeah. as long as we service those six buildings. Sure. You know, and engage the families and the women in the community. Yeah. So that was really exciting work. Absolutely. You yeah. know, from, um, I think it, we began in 87, or 86. Sure. And um, I played different parts. We yeah. all played different parts. And Isaiah was, a, a, originally we hired a director, but she had no clue on our vision yeah. and our mission. So then Isaiah ended up being the, the director. Yeah. You know, Isaiah, a, she grew up in East Harlem in the project. Sure. And she had a very good friend who was killed mm. 
you know, who was killed. And um, so the center was dedicated to Elba. Yeah. You know. And um, so everybody there was moved to sure. this work. Right, so from Isaiah became the executive director, she was the, the ED until 02. Yeah. I did a lot of the programming sure. and the training. You know, I didn't get paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so it's not like this was my job. Yeah. Actually, I, I had been working at the LaGuardia Community College okay, okay. in a return to work program. Yeah. You know, and they, after two years or whatever, they didn't get the funding and the program closed down. But I got, I got a unemployment. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I could really do this work. Sure, you know, sure. I, I didn't really, so, so that, this work here in the Bronx, I think made a real difference for many, many, many women. Absolutely. Um, who, you know, just not for straight, yeah. women yeah. but for lesbians sure. and at the time we were just dealing with biological women yeah later on when I mean I left in in the fall yeah. of 01 mm. and I they left in 02 and she passed it on to one of the women who had come through the program okay sure sure right so it D a also very powerful, very powerful young woman, a Di Malte. Mm -hmm. She became the, the ED, and um, they opened it up to transgenders. And they closed shop on 2013. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, for it was it was a challenge because we had received the pay, the space for free sure. because to give service to the community yeah. and the, they weren't giving service to the community so the management asked them to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They were doing I think good work. Yeah. You know, on a city, maybe citywide, national level. Sure. A, but not the work that this community needed. Yeah. Um the other thing about Casa that I think it was important is that we combine the healing aspects sure. with activism. Yeah. So we would go to peace demonstration, we would go to women demonstration, housing, yeah. education. We would take the people there. The other thing that was unique was that, and, and it was very interesting, is, you know, when we first opened, women would come with their benefit cards yeah. and say, I said, you don't need that. Yeah. Right? So it was free service without sure. a benefit sure. card. No, you know, people didn't want to give us their full name. We didn't care. Yeah. You know, we fed people. Yeah. We had a youth, a girls program. They were called Fuerza. Okay, okay, and yeah. We did similar work, and then we did the, the program with older women, which was, you know, from just loving themselves and dancing and, yeah. you know, African dance and and we did martial arts and yeah. we did arts sure. you know and we taught how do you do an altar a yeah. goddess altar sure. for yourself so it's very very different yeah and very womanist yeah you know womanist um a 
men wanted pizza. We would say, no, no, this is just for women. Sure, sure, sure. Right? Harry, Harry was one, I don't remember Harry's last name. Anyway, Harry was one of the fun, founders of this garden mm. that we are in. Yeah. And I remember it, the first day he knocked on our door, you know, and we were like, go, <gasps> white man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we would do things together. Sure. Like they gave us, they gave us a a box to work with the young, yeah. the young women. So we, we, I've been here working in this garden since 1996, I think, or wow. seven. You wow. know, and not, not actively in the organizing, but just whenever, because, you know, I live in Washington Heights, sure, along sure. the west side. And it's interesting when you ask me about my activism here, yeah. I was thinking, and then I said, oh my God, I've done so much work. Yeah, you and know? it's just interesting how rooted you are in this, you know, very particular space with the garden, with a lot of the things you've been involved in within a block or two of, of this garden. I mean, it's such a rich history on a very, very local, yes. local level, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, and it's also interesting to hear, you know, it's it's like a progression uh, because from, from El Comité to uh, the Acupuncture Center and Lincoln Detox to uh, the People's Health Clinic, like, you know, it, it, it it's, it's interesting to see your political progression um, over the years, so I wondered if you wanted to, to say a little bit about, um, about that, how you've evolved politically, but also, you know, uh, with more of an eye towards um, natural healing over the years, and or maybe that's always been a part of your political practice, but... Well, look, I, be, I became a Marxist very early on sure. in my life. Sure. You know, I would say, you know, I was a socialist, I, w I had been exposed to Marxism and to organizing. I grew up very poor. Yeah. My aunt and my mother and people I grew up with, were union people. Sure, sure. But I grew very poor. Yeah. And um, for me, my, my, uh, Marxism saved my life. Yeah. Because I was a street kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I was a street kid. And what does that mean? You know, I ran the streets of New York. That's why I knew so many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, yeah. I went, I was a, a dancer. I went to nightclubs, yeah. you know. I was an alkie drinking. Sure. And there was also the part of me that wanted more and questioned poverty. Yeah. And, um, and then on the, you know, I, my mother, wanted to baptize me when yeah. I was around 12 and she asked me it's time you got to get baptized blah, blah, blah. and and I, I said no yeah and she said why don't you want to be baptized and I said because if there was a God we wouldn't be so miserable sure sure this is a kid a 12 yeah. year old so just so that you know that I've always had this this can be life yeah, yeah. Right? I started my own healing practice. And my mother, because I think it's very important, even though she beat my ass, right? Yeah. My mother was a healer, my sure. aunts. I come from a legacy of healers. Yeah. And I witnessed them healing the community. My, my mother's, uh, our home was open to people. I mean, she didn't even lock the door. Yeah. And you know she fed community, and if somebody needed healing or you know somebody got shot or got caught, they would come to my mother first. Wow, yeah, yeah. 
So that's how I grew up. Sure. I grew up in in a contradictory situation because I was being abused, yeah. but at the same time, a very loving and caring. Sure, sure. You know. So, you know, my mother said, you got to eat a lot of vegetables, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She was, she, herbs and everything healthy, yeah. except we ate a lot of meat. <laughs> so, a, for me, becoming a healer of yeah. some kind was not because... I wanted to heal myself. Sure, I was sure. very sickly. Yeah. You know, I had asthma. I had bronchial asthma. I've had pneumonia three times. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. At the age of uh, 22, I had a very serious nervous breakdown. Mm. That's when I stopped drinking. Sure. Um, because I was in a car accident. Oh, wow. So I, it really brought up all this stuff. And I began to look for alternatives. And yeah. I always, since I was a kid, went to chiropractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and where I went for my healing was Harlem. Yeah, yeah. You know, was Harlem. There was a, I guess they must have been in their 30s group called Aquarius oh, okay, okay. in Harlem and they had and they had um, they did alternative medicine they even had a, a food co-op oh, okay, okay. this was wow. in the early 70s they yeah. were amazing they were also very healthy beautiful people that I wanted to be like sure there was a uh, the tree of life mm. on a hundred and 25th Street, right in the corner, and um, you know where the state office building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Adam Clayton Powell, Adam right Clayton there in 125th. It was called the Tree of Life, and it was a bookstore. You could get herbs, you could get take classes. Yeah. And I did that. Yeah. And I went to Dyer. Yeah. Dyer Associates. I got. I learned how to fast, do yoga with her. Okay, sure. I um got colonics so but this was for my healing yeah 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 because yeah. i was a mess yeah right and in doing for myself i was able to do for others absolutely so that's why i was at at the people's a uh, clinic the, sure at lincoln and lincoln yeah, and yeah. that outside of the politics yeah for you sure. know and i was dealing look i once worked in a junior in a junior high school mm. as a drunk drug counselor okay okay yeah. i had drug users who were 10 years old yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i i just to know that i you know i i started with someone else a cultural Center, Manhattan Avenue, 107th Street, sure. Manhattan Avenue, no, Columbus Avenue, a, and it was to deal with the problem of drugs with the youth. It yeah. was a beautiful space. We had great cl clinicians. One, and that was doing draft counseling there. Yeah. And I was the program director. Yeah. Okay. So I want to know that. I've been working with addictions sure. since I was very young. Yeah. I I consider, you know, even though I've never been to AA, that when I stopped drinking because I was having blackouts, yeah. is because I was a I drank from the age of fourteen until sure. I was twenty two and I was an alcoholic. Yeah. I haven't drank since yeah. then. I mean alcohol and I so, just to really get a sure. sense from this political activist 
who's also in healing and takes everything she learns and brings it to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. So that's how I became, in quotes, a healer. Sure. You know, um, I mean, I, I, have, I come from a, a lineage of healers. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of healing in, in my in my lifetime, you sure. know, ma mostly from a Taino indigenous perspective, yeah. an earth-based that, and I'm an earth-based healer. Yeah. Right. Um. So like, that's what gets me to be here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is. You know, if I'm not, I mean, I can't be here because it's expensive now with COVID for me to come here. I, I try to come every two weeks, but I'm always walking by the river. Yeah. Yeah. By the river in Washington Heights, by sure. river, Riverside Drive. I think it's called Washington, Washington Park. I'm, I'm in nature. Yeah. I, my backyard with Central Park and Riverside Park, yeah, you yeah. know, and that's how I grew up in nature. Yeah. So, you know, and I always say healer question mark because people say I'm a healer. Sure, sure, sure. Right, so I, I say, okay, I'm a healer. Yeah, yeah. You know, because that's how people experience me, you know, very spiritual. Um, and I've done a wondrous healing work on myself, yeah. you know, and with community. Sure. You know, with community. So, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I while, while you were talking, I was just thinking, I don't remember the exact quote, but, um, but I read it not too long ago. Maybe it's from Lennon, who knows who it's from, but, um, but something along the lines of, as uh, uh, you know, capitalism continues to enter its you know, uh, you know, stages of decay, more and more people realize that it's not just a matter of you know, wages and workplace, that it's you know, literally a whole war against the earth, against, uh, uh, against women, against people's mental health, everything along those lines, and it's clear that, you know, you've been fighting it on all of those fronts for, yes, you I know, have. from the very beginning of your life. Well, really. you know, <laughs> one of my favorite books was Lenin, What's to be Done. Yeah. Right? And the whole issue about we got to organize beyond the economic struggle. Yeah. We have to do that. Yeah. And then we have to, you know, and Malcolm says, by any means necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we win the hearts and minds of our people? Absolutely. Right? How do we win the... Our people are suffering from internalized oppression. Absolutely. Right? And capitalism, capitalism as Fanon says, dehumanizes us. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. how do we reclaim our humanity sure. so that part of claiming your humanity is connecting back to the earth yeah. and yeah, protecting yeah, yeah. the earth, yeah. right? And standing with the earth. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And standing with the earth. Look, I told you I do ceramic sculpture. Yeah. I have a friend. You know, I, I belong to this Puerto Rican Artists Association. It's called Brida. Mm. Puerto Rican Developing? Anyway, Development Organ, something. And he said to me, and this is somebody who I love and respect and loves and respect me, so it wasn't yeah. like a hostile thing. Sure. He said to me, Why don't you do some more political art? <laughs> Why don't you do political art? Right? So I said to him, this is political art. 
Absolutely. Right? The Atabe, it signifies the Earth Mother. Definitely. Right? And I, this is what I stand for. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I don't do, you know, I, don't, I love, I tell you, you know, the, 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 the ceramic, the clay statues in China? Sure, sure, yeah. You know, I mean, they're amazing. They are amazing, yeah. I love them, but that's not the kind of art that I do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love what is it, his social realism art that came out of Russia. Yeah, yeah. But that's not what I do. Sure, sure. I do earth-based art. Absolutely. I reclaim our ancestors. Yeah. Right? And um, and for me, doing this work, it's a political statement. Definitely. Right? Definitely. And sharing it with my community. Yeah. Right? Um, I once had, in the 90s, I had a private practice. I'm not clinical, I'm not a clinical socialist. Sure. But because I've done so much social work in my life. Yeah. And because I developed this model, a model which is really based on Fanon and Pablo Freire. Sure, sure. Work, right? And how do we really transform the hearts and minds of our people yeah. and move them to the next level. Yeah. So I say to people all the time that I'm a way station, yeah. a place where people come and get some water Sure, sure. when they are dying, yeah. basically. Yeah. You know, I mean, people say that doing this work saved their lives. Yeah. I'm sure. You know, I'm I sure. say that too. Doing this work saved my life. So, now I lost the thread. What I was going to say. Um, we'll come back. But it, it's, it's just that how do we intertwine everything? Yeah. Right? How do we do the economic organizing sure. but from a place of power yeah. a place of love and not a place where you're begging yeah 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 right yeah, and how do we create our own spaces yeah right and push the capitalists yeah and um and how do we actually bring our community to that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I said earlier to you, you know, I'm not big on electoral politics. Sure. But I support, I know a lot of people in electoral politics. Yeah, yeah. Right? Good people. Sure. Who, and I just say, I just say, look, everything that, it, that, that glitters is not gold. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And don't, get taken, your mind taken over by these people who at the end are capitalists yep. and they're going to step, put your, the boot in up your ass. The second they can, yeah. Yeah, the second <laughs> they can. So, but I will work with anybody who wants to heal. Definitely. Anyone who wants to transform because I don't talk about change. Yeah. I talk about transforming society sure. because I always say look you could change your underwear <laughs> every day yeah okay but how do you transform so that you don't have to wear underwear <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny I like yeah, that though you yeah, know? yeah yeah so so that's what basically my organizing is sure. like. 
right now, I think that the only Bronx thing that I'm doing is the garden. Yeah. There is, and I told you, Michael Johnson, a, what do they call? Anyway, they are, Pierce? No, 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 no. And they're, um, they're up here on 140th, okay, okay. where the clinic was. Oh, okay. And they are working on bringing back the cl clinic. Oh, okay, <laughs> I don't know, sure. like a center or something. I do volunteer work um, with Fierce. Sure, yeah. Which is a queer youth a center up in... Um, Fordham and Morris. Yeah. And what I'm doing there is training people in emotional healing. Okay, sure. I'm doing great work. You know how we protect all these queer youth yeah. who get thrown out of their home, who get raped, who <clears throat> who are constantly being attacked. Yeah. Right? Um, anything else I'm doing in the Bronx? You know, and then I support organizers all over the city, including sure. the Bronx. I don't know if you remember last year some organizers got beat up from, by the police, about 200 of them. Yeah, right, right. Right down here? Yeah, definitely. Right? I was supporting them. Yeah. When the, the, the Pulse, when the Pulse, when they killed those queer folks in Florida, yeah. we do healing circles, open community healing circles. Sure. And we had drumming circles. Um, it depends on what organizers yeah. want to do. So I support I support a lot of Bronx organizers. Sure. Um, I just did something yesterday. Okay. Yeah. For the point. Okay. Yeah. 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 And they had they had an open mic. Um, and they asked me to participate. Yeah. <clears throat> and I talked about violence against women sure. and the importance for men to organize men to stop the violence against women. Yeah. And I do that kind of work. Yeah. You know. I'm not working, working, working because I just retired in May. Okay, sure, yeah. You know, at 75. Yeah. And, but I'm still out here in my community. Yeah. You know, I support, I'm going to be at a demonstration in the Lower East Side for Puerto Rico on Sunday. Oh, okay. I've heard, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. on Sunday. And uh, um, so I'm still doing work, not in the same way. Sure, Because sure. for instance, as, as you know, I only come here in a cab. Yeah, yeah. I'm not vaccinated. Yeah. Um, I, I am very healthy. Sure. And I don't want to get sick, so I don't take the vaccine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, or people actually pick me up and take me. Okay, places. sure. I've been in a few car, car caravans yeah. during COVID around police violence, police killing, that kind of thing. Sure. And then I just support organizers. You know, whatever people are doing, and they want to speak to me, I'm available. What I did all of, during, all last year, was see people by the river. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, see people by the river. They want, they want counseling by the river. They don't have to pay me anything. They want to give me a donation. I'll take it. Yeah. You know, it's it's. This is how I live my life. Sure. Sure. In in um, in celebration and transformation and generating peace. Yeah. You know, peace for myself. 
And it's a very violent, very violent time for all of us, but in particular women. You know, and I'm talking worldwide and, you know, and right here, yeah. right now. Yeah. Right? A, and it's on us, you know, it's on you Absolutely. as a man to talk to your friends and say, how do we stop violence against women? Sure, sure, right? sure. How do we do it? Men have to talk to each other and they have to actually share. They actually have to share their story. Yeah. You know, um, I raced this Monday, Monday night, and the one guy actually told his story, you know, that his father was abusive. Yeah. And that he once, he was beating his mom, and the kid jumped his father, and yeah. the father hit the kid. I mean, you know, people got their own stories. So how are we going to purge ourselves Absolutely. if we're in silence? I know. Yeah. And if men don't stand up and say, you know, because there is direct abuse and then there is abuse because of your conditioning as a male and the privilege yeah, 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 that yeah. you get from the patriarchy and capitalism. Definitely, definitely. You know? I mean, you're a white man, so it's also the privilege as a white man. Absolutely. So, that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. You know, I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm holding men accountable. I'm here in this garden. I'm supporting Create Juice. And sure. I'm doing healing circles for women. Sure, sure. Um, so as far as your healing practices go, uh, what are some of the healing practices that you developed over the years? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's some that you have been doing from the get-go, but I imagine there's some that you developed either by yourself or maybe with others collectively over the years? Well, look, I come from a lineage of healing. So I have, I do hands-on healing. Sure. You know, and that's part of, you know, I heal with herbs, as I said to you. Yeah. And food. Um, I teach people how to cook in my practice. I, how to use herbs, how to use crystals, yeah. how to do affirmations, how to meditate. Sure. I do all that. Everything, yeah. However, the the practice that I've developed, yeah. it's emotional release work. Sure. And how so oppression get stored in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the idea is to get it out of your body. And, you know, people exercise, people um, meditate, people eat healthy, people do a lot of things, but it's still in the body. Sure, sure. So, the work is with your breath, with the breath, to connect to your body, yeah. to visualize what's there, sure. and to release it through either, like babies do, right? Yeah. Either shaking, either screaming, either crying, yeah. eating, either laughing or either yawning. Yeah. You know, when you do any of those things with a focus on feeling the energy or the stress or the pain that's in your body, sure. you are able to release it. The important thing is what do you do after you release it? Yeah. What do we put in the space so that, you know, there is the, you take a glass of muddy water, right, which is the oppression. Sure. 
and then you do release work yeah. and you empty the glass. Yeah. Right? There is still residue in the glass. Sure, sure. Right? So you gotta work on that. And you have to be real conscious because we live in a capitalist society. So I'm emptying my glass and the capitalists are filling yeah. filling filling it up. Yeah. Right? They're filling it up. So this work is very dialectic. Sure. Um and it's really dealing with physics. Yeah. So I want you to really think about quantum physics. Sure. In relationship to this work. work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and the work is never ending. Sure. Yeah. Right. That's for sure. Yeah. It's because you got all this residue. Yeah. And you. I always say you want to hit the mother load, right? Yeah. You uh, and you want to feel release the trauma. Yeah. Release the trauma. But we're scared. Yeah. You know we have this is what we want to do, and then we're either drinking, smoking, whatever, drugging, whatever we're doing, you know. I tell people, please don't take any medication when you're doing this work. Sure, sure. Right? Cloud some mind. It, and it, you're not present. Yeah. The importance of this work is to be present. Yeah. Okay? It's um, very intense work. Sure. Um, and it's life work. Yeah. This is not a panacea. Yeah. This is going to be for the rest of your life. Yeah. Whenever you get triggered, you have the techniques to work yourself. Sure. And you don't have to go to a therapist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You don't have to take medication. Yeah. You are your own healer. Definitely. Right? I say to people, be very careful who you give your mind to. Right, because people go to a therapist, they don't know who, how this person is, who they are, what they believe. Yeah, definitely. You know, somebody told me this woman who is exploring, a, a, a white woman who's a, a psychiatrist or psychologist, whatever, and she's exploring, she's a doctor, so whatever, and she's exploring the whole spirituality thing and ancestors sure. and all these things and I said who do you base your work on yeah, yeah. right and she said Freud I said <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the guy the guy first of all he was he was a uh, uh, an addict yeah yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He was an addict. I think it was morphine. Yeah. His deep addiction. And he was anti women. Racist colonialist. Uh, yes, and <laughs> he was that. he was a you know the the, the thing is that, that people talk about the Frank 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 Quins what's that word? Any welcome the word will come. The school that he had in 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 Germany. Oh the Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Yeah, 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 the yeah. Frankfurt school, right? Yeah. And that we know that people left the humanists. Yeah. All the humanists left. Yeah. They were all Marxists. Yeah. Right? Freud. They were all Marx and the humanists left. Yeah. Because of the body center. And this is a long time ago. Yeah, 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 definitely. Right? Definitely. And Reich, I think the guy's name was Reich, who who wrote the D 
the psychology of fascism. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He left and he went to work in the ghetto with the working class youth. Sure. Right? Which Freud would never do. No way. No way. Okay? Only the bourgeois for him. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you gotta be real careful. Absolutely. And I mean. And the way he fucked with people. Mind, yeah, right, and women believe, and and to this day, the people, it's like the woman's fault. This, you know, hysteria. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. It's like. I know, and and so much of the natural healing methods of the European peasantry, all of that's been wiped out. You know, not not completely, but there's still traces of it. But you know. There's a history there that, as a white person, is a lot more difficult for me to access. Well, because there's not the continuity. Um, have you ever heard of Starhawk? Oh, I have. I, I never read anything by hey, her. But, you should read. Yeah. You should read. Um, she's an Echo, Echo warrior. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, yeah, ecological yeah. war. She actually trains as a training. She's about. She might be older than me. Sure. Uh, she has brought back, I mean, she's a Jewish woman, and she has brought back many of the practices for the white women. Yeah. There's a, uh, a Jewish woman's group that's very active, um, and they train Jewish women in the practices, yeah. the European practices in healing. Her name, her, I remember the name. And uh, there's a woman, Susan Weed, I just used her book. Mm. She's also older, a little older than me. Uh, the Menopausal Years, mm. I just did a workshop. Sure. Um, womb healing workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, has a lot of, she's an herbalist, upstate New York. You know, these are the people that need to be researched. Yeah. People reclaiming, reclaiming culture. Definitely. Earth-based culture. And then coming together with people of color in coalitions Absolutely. and seeing what they have in common and what they, can learn from each other. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, see? Yeah. But these women are anti active anti racist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Right? And we don't see much of that. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, well, so one question I had about uh, kind of er an earlier period in the Bronx, you mentioned Evelina Antonetti, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about political mentors from the older generation that you knew um, or knew of who were based in the Bronx or did a lot of work in the Bronx? Okay. Outside of Evelina, right, you have Helena Valentin. Mm. The, 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 the issue is that the folks that were mentoring at that time were meeting we're meeting together. Sure, sure. I think I said to you, you need to read a Olga White Weinheim's book from Colonia to, to from from Colonia to Colony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there she talks about a lot of that organizing. Sure. Um, and maybe you know. Um, Elba, what's Elba's? Anyway, Elba is Evelina's sister, sure. who's still alive. Wow, wow, She's in yeah. her 80s. Wow, okay. Right? Yeah. So, you know, you need to talk to some, I mean, I'm an elder, but uh, other... Uh, yeah, a generation older. Uh, 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 that they're still around. Yeah, yeah. Right? And um, you know, 
many of them have passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. However, you know, at least you have history from um, Antonia Pantoja. Sure, sure. One of the people who organized and I supported her effort also in the 70s, yeah. older person was Dr. Helen Rodriguez, mm. who did the work around stopping sterilization abuse sure. at a Lincoln. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and getting rid of a doctor who headed the sterilization, the ster sterilization abuse program at Puerto Rico mm. and was at Lincoln Hospital. Wow. You know, so you could look, I mean, You'll find information on Helen because she was the the president of the National Public Health. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's this information on Antonetti. Sure, You know, sure. so I worked with a, a committee in the 70 called Caraza, which was committee against... Committee okay. maybe racism and still safety. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and the war came out of the Bronx. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, so people like that, I mean, they're dead, but at least you can look at some of the work so it doesn't get lost. Sure. At the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, that's a lot on Evelina, the library is name after the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they have Helen's paper. Mm, I don't know if they do either, but yeah. I know but they have a you know, for her. Sure. It would be really important. Um, I'm trying to think of men. You know, and I, I think I mentioned to you that it, the Communist Party had a section with the Puerto Ricans, sure, sure. you could look at that. People like Jesus Colón, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, and Fernando Vega, mm -hmm. right? Um, even though you know people deal with them as culturalists, not as brilliant organizers. And yeah, I know, I know. Hey, hopefully, that's not going to happen to me. People just deal with me as a healer. I'll haunt them. <laughs> I fucking will haunt them. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Eh. And I, and, and for a long time, we have honored Puerto Rican women. Yeah. And we had this committee called the Committee to Honor Puerto Rican Women. Mm -hmm. And we would always find someone who had passed. Yeah. And then uh, someone, an elder organizer and a young woman. Sure. And the two honor. Wow. Right. Yeah. And we would always honor socialists and communist women. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you could look you could look at that. And and I remember you saying in um, your oral history at, at the Central that um, Evelina was a socialist, even though people might not have realized it, or people might not choose to remember that part of her of her life. But um. and yes, I mean, as I said, as I said to you, that a there's a book you could read. I, I um, pledge my consciousness mm. by Vito Marcantonio. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Who yeah. was a city council and a congressman from East Harlem. Yeah. Who was a member of the American Labor Party. Sure. Who 
Evelina was a member of the as a teenager. Yeah. It's a beautiful picture of her speaking for them. Yeah. And and she was trained by by Vito Mangandoni. Yeah. You know? So there's so much there is so much, so many people that have mentored people who have mentored other people. Yeah, definitely. You know, and Evelina never ran for anything, but she's she was really involved with the Democratic Party party machine. But sure. she held everybody at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? <laughs> as you, as you, you have to. She it. was an amazing <laughs> human being. But just so I would I would just it's it's you know doing a little research, doing study. Sure. You know. Um, I always tell people I'm a lay lay historian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have that's why I really do these oral history. Yeah. Because I have all this story in my head. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, so much of it too, you can't there's either not the documentary sources or you don't get the same picture from the documents anyway. So um, hearing it directly from you is uh, a very profound experience, you know? Um, and uh, uh, another thing I was wondering for you, this is a broader, um, kind of broader question is, what does the Bronx represent to you? Freedom. It's like the last stand yeah. for the working class. Definitely. A creativity. Yeah. Um, no matter what, we're going to do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And the other thing is consistency. Yeah. You know, you, you take something like this, this community garden, and they've been here since 89. Yeah, wonderful. You know, and that's what organizing should be. Yeah. And they've been able to pass on this legacy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And work with the city and work with the politicians fight them tooth and nail. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Uh, you know, the Bronx is green. Yeah, yeah. Most you parkland know, and You know, it, it's like, and people are always finding more how to continue to make green spaces. Yeah. You know, and there are so many community organizations Definitely. You know, like Mothers on the Move. Yeah. Right. Nos quedamos. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, uh, rich history. Pregones, the, the, yeah. the theater the company theater. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable organizing. Yeah. Right? Um, it's just so many, you know, and, and it's a shame that the gentry is back. Yep. And the food, the fruit of our labor, yeah, right, yeah, is the gentry. And because Puerto Ricans forgive everybody and their mother, yeah, and will work with anybody, and with no. And people don't have to do anything, sure. right, in return. But that's not the case with the gentry. No. You know, they want to take, they want to take everything that is ours. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, when, when I talk about the gentry, I'm talking about the capitalists, the people who really believe in capitalism and who just want to sell their products. Yeah, yeah. And who... Don't give two fucks. 
Absolutely. about, I mean, the number of homelessness. I know. You know, I mean, if people with money would just give 1%. I know, I know. You won't have homelessness. I know. You know, it's crazy. I know. But instead, they, they give 0.0001%. And, and since it, it's such a large sum to any person who works, it seems like such a large amount, but it's nothing. We give more when we give $20 to, to someone than they give in an entire lifetime, usually. That's crazy. So it's finding a way, you know, and I promote dialogue. Yeah. Um, I promote people looking at race, class, and gender. Sure. And their life and their privilege and how do we undo yeah. oppression. Yeah. Right? And that's what I train people in. You know, one of the things that I've worked on and I've been doing it since the 80s is I do this power and oppression workshop sure. that with Pablo Freire methodology that I really created for teenagers. Yeah. And you know, you you present it to and it's basically how capitalism works. Yeah. And you present it to adults with degrees and they go, Oh my god. <laughs> it's like and and not only looking at capitalism, but looking at your role in capitalism. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So the it, the the name of the organization or group or collective because you know we're not a 501c3 sure sure yeah and we're not mm -hmm. gonna be it's called urban atabe okay okay yeah yeah okay. yeah okay healing and organizing in community and that's a that's a direct continuation from Casa Atabex. And that's a, a direct co continuation from the people's health. Yeah. The the St. Anne's and St. Anne's and the and Lincoln Detox. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the vision and the vision of the Panthers and the young lords. Yeah. And many young people in the 60s and the 70s. It, this is, I say, and I say, this is their legacy. Yeah. You know, this, and hopefully, and I feel like this is the last team that I'm training. They're yeah. Almost finished. Yeah. I think in another year. They've been training with me like for five years. Okay, yeah, yeah. A, we'll continue this work. Sure, sure. We'll continue this work. Um, and they will pass it on yeah. to other young people. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's the unending story. That's what capitalism is. Yeah. And just when we think we got it, they figure out how another way. Uh huh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think we shouldn't despair. Yeah. I think what we need to do is, is be in dialogue, yeah. in community, and um, and generate love, Definitely. You know, love and and understanding and caring for one another. Um, you know, and teach people how to think. Yeah. You know, how to read, how to be able to analyze things, yeah. right? My, if I would say I would have a fear, is that young people are not learning how to read and think analytically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Definitely. And, you know, as a person who basically learned to read at 17, yeah. I think it's key. Yeah. That we learn to read and, you know, I don't know if you know the Algebra Project. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. You know, the Algebra Projects, 
belief is that you start young people with algebra, yeah. not math, yeah. basic math, but algebra. I believe that you need to teach elementary children to think critically. They need, we have to figure out, and maybe somebody has done it, how to teach dialectical historical materialism yeah. in a way, because that's what people need. Absolutely. People need to think. And then if you learn how to think critically, dialectically, then you can deal with anything. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what fucking saved my life. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> And I and I and I want more. Yeah. You know, and all the people who develop, developed um, the undoing racism work, and the people who who develop um, the conflict resolution work. Yeah. The people that develop the. Um, remember anyway all these different ways of te teaching people how to think how to deal with develop a emotional intelligence yeah right critical thinking and develop an emotional intelligence the young people who are doing I don't know if you do know momentum education oh no I haven't heard you of it. should yeah. you should check it out you know it's like that's what we need to do. Yeah. You know, we need to develop critical thinking and emotional intelligence. Sure. And you can you got to read to do that. Yeah. You know, or if you're not going to read cuz initially with all the I my learning was visually through film. Okay, yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know. So but I don't despair. I think just as my generation figured it out, just yes. as your generation it figured it out, there will be another generation and another generation, and they will figure it out, and we will continue to survive as human beings. Sure, sure. If they don't kill the planet, or if, yeah. you know, or us through their virus experiments. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, is there, are there other parts of your life that you'd like to share? Uh, well, not right, right now, because I'm tired. Yeah, I figured it was probably getting to the point um, where we should wrap things up. But we here. could, we could do another session. You could think about it. Sure, you sure. Know, you could think, you could think about it and then come up with some more questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Because I am busted. <laughs> you juice me. You juice me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing everything uh, uh, that you did share today and in this wonderful space with your artwork right behind you. Um, and yeah, this has been really